I'm Bob Wolven. I'm uh, an associate university librarian here at Columbia and uh, sort of your master of ceremonies for at least part of the day. Uh, I want to say how pleased we are that so many people were able to come today for this discussion and exploration of tools and collaborations around web archiving. Uh, it's, it's just about a little over three years now since uh, Columbia convened another meeting elsewhere on campus uh, to, which we rather grandiosely called a summit on web archiving. Uh, to bring together, we had about some three dozen people um, sitting around talking about the issues and challenges being faced by the people working in this field and trying to begin to think about ways to address those issues and, and meet those challenges. Uh, in, in many ways that, that I'll come back to in a little detail a bit later, this meeting is a, an outgrowth of, of that, uh, that earlier session. Uh, Many of the things we'll be talking about today uh, are relevant and responsive to the issues and the challenges we talked about then. But a lot has happened in three years. Uh, as I was just talking with, with Jim Neal, uh, you know, th this field has changed a good deal over, over a rather short period of time and undoubtedly still has a long way to go. Um, the, the changes are reflected in the, the size and nature of the audience here today. We have uh, researchers, scholars, developers, as librarians, technologists, so a, a rather diverse uh, group of people with a rather diverse group of interests around this area. Uh, the program today has two broad themes reflected in the two words, tools and, and, uh, and collaborations. Uh, the tools being developed to facilitate the process of web archiving, the, uh, the re success of that process, the results, and the collaborations that we are going to need to, to do this at a larger scale and to make it work. Uh, to some extent, the choice of those themes is self-serving. They, they correspond to work that's going on here in Columbia's own web archiving program and two major components of a grant that we have from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, which is now in its third and final year. But I hope in this case, self-interest correlates with a lot of other people's interests. We think that this is uh, reflective of what's going on in the field in general, and that many people will find uh, uh, some of these things of, of interest as we explore them during the day. At first appearance, the two themes, tools and collaborations, are quite different and engage different people. Uh, and that's reflected again in the makeup of the audience today. But it's also, uh, if there's one thing I can say that's a salient thing to say about web archiving, it's as it relates to libraries, nobody quite knows where it fits. It has aspects of collection development, of preservation, of information technology, of institutional archiving, special collections. And so our hope is that the, the ideas we talk about today and the projects and activities that are going on uh, will find something that resonates with everyone here and maybe point out and even create some connections that uh, may not be obvious. So before introducing our first speaker for the day, I just want to go through some of the, the logistics. Uh, I trust most of you by now have figured out how to connect to Wi-Fi. Uh, you've got a choice of EduRome or the Columbia network. If you just look at Columbia University, the non-secured network, you should be able to get in with no problems. Um, Many of you have probably also found the bathrooms, but in any case, they're over there. You can get to them either through either door of the room on this floor. Uh, we are videotaping and recording the session today. Uh, so when we get to questions and answers, we will have uh, microphones that, that wireless microphones circulating through the audience. And we'd ask if possible that you uh, use the microphones just so that your question gets recorded as well. We do have a hashtag, which is up there. Um, also, you'll note, we, I didn't want people, we were talking about this last night with the speakers, we didn't want people staring out the windows all day, so we've put up the, the view of New York City there, and you can substitute for looking at the, the. Um, we will have lunch in this room, and following lunch, we have uh, arranged a few lightning talks of people who have, uh, you know, quick things they want to talk about here. And if anyone uh, would like to give a lightning talk and hasn't said so yet, see me or one of the organizers uh, during the course of the morning. Uh, there will be a reception at the end of the day, which will be in the cafeteria, well, in the cafe on the sixth floor. Uh, we'll say more about that when the time comes, and I hope many of you will be able to stay for that. And finally, I, I do want to, uh, to thank a number of people. It's always, as Jim was saying, it's always risky thanking people because you inevitably leave someone out and hit yourself in the head later. But I'm going to do my best anyway. Um, 
First of all, I want to thank the people on the steering committee here at Columbia uh, who steer our web archiving program. It also helped to organize and, and really did the bulk of the work organizing this event. Um, boy, I should have written their names down, but I'm going to do it by memory. I shouldn't be able to remember. Stephen Davis, Pamela Graham, Kate Harcourt, uh, Anna Parici, and Alex Thurman, and especially Alex and Anna, who really did the bulk of the work for, for organizing this. If I could just ask you to stand for a minute. The, Five. Now, I wasn't asking you to applaud them. I'm asking you to memorize their faces so that if you, uh, if you have any questions or problems, see, see one of them or, or me during the course of the day. Um, four of our other staff have, have very graciously volunteered to help out with the registration table, with the microphones, and so forth. So uh, you'll see them during the course of the day, too. That's Naima Akhtar, uh, Ryan Graham, Kate Birch and Bill Hamilton, and uh, you'll, you'll notice them. Uh, I especially want to thank the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation for making our program possible and for uh, the funding, that, a lot of the activity that we'll be talking about today, and I'll say a bit more about that in a bit, too. But first and foremost, let me introduce, as our first speaker today, to introduce this session and kick it off, Jim Neal, the University Librarian Emeritus here at Columbia. I'm sure many of you uh, know Jim from his, his long and illustrious career working in libraries and leading uh, areas of information policy and in, uh, intellectual property and many other things. And um, it, by prearrangement, I'm not going to try to, to go through all of his, uh, his uh, accomplishments. But I do want to mention why it's so appropriate that he be leading off this session. It's really thanks to Jim that we started web archiving here at Columbia. Uh, he really uh, was an inspiration for that and a very early advocate of the role of libraries and the importance of web archiving for libraries and for scholarship. And so I will let him say more about why that's the case. Jim? Thanks, Bob. Uh, as university librarian, I was very used to being trotted uh, in front of conferences on campus uh, to provide that proverbial administrative welcome and greeting. Um, and so I was pleased when Bob asked me to offer a, uh, a full three-hour morning workshop at this <laughs> session. Uh, but a couple weeks ago, he said, no, no, we don't have enough time, Jim. You're going to have to cut that down to about an hour keynote. And I said, OK, I can do that. And he said, oh, by the way, Jim, um, we're going to have to make it even shorter. Uh, we're going to give you about 30 minutes to do your thing. And then last night, he called me and said, Jim, you got five minutes to say what you want to do. But uh, uh, I'm going I'm to stick to my 30 minutes and uh, share some ideas and perspectives with you. Um, I'd like to, to sort of dedicate my remarks uh, today uh, to an uh, extraordinary colleague and friend, uh, Dan Hazen uh, from Harvard University who many of us worked with for many, many years, uh, a remarkable, remarkably smart, thoughtful, provocative guy, and uh, he passed uh, recently. And so um, let's keep him in mind as we think about these issues today. So I've noticed over the last several years that my public presentations have become much more alarmist and much more strident. Um, I have subscribed to the Emerson adage uh, sometimes a scream is better than a thesis. Uh, much of my recent angst has focused on our alarming collective failure to capture, organize, and preserve long-term the availability and usability of the born scientific and cultural record. For my remarks today, I draw from a recent presentation at the OCLC Regional Council meeting in Florence and from a brief paper I published in the May 2015 American Libraries. My lens is the university and the library. We would all acknowledge that the world is producing vast amounts of born digital materials. Clearly, the volume, complexity, and dynamism of this content transcend our traditional information practices. The Columbia Libraries, along with a number of players around the US and the world, began to explore this challenge a few years ago with generous support from the Mellon Foundation. We sought to examine and evaluate the policy, workflow, legal, governance, financial, and service frameworks 
for collecting and archiving open web content. Websites and documents are the tip of the born digital condition. Born digital content comes in an ever expanding array of forms and formats. Consider just the following examples. Published and licensed work, such as e-journals, e-books, e-video, e-audio, from commercial and trade sources, but the explosion from the growing array of independent publishers and distributors and the revolution in self-publishing and self-distribution. We have no idea what's going on in those environments. The output of e-government, online learning and training materials, research data from universities and corporations, social media in all of its wonderful expressions, electronic archives that come with personal and organizational papers, records of organizations including email, manuscripts, business papers, and financial information, pictorial images, spatial data, and longitudinal observations, software applications, both proprietary and open source, video games, medical data with the inherent challenges of patient privacy, live feeds like RSS and news information from around the world, visualizations and simulations, interoperable metadata, and so on and so on with so many new things that will grow in intensity and intricacy. I argue that in many ways we are dealing with an issue of integrity. The coherence and rectitude of scholarship, I believe, is at risk. We all must adhere to a code and standard of values, maintaining human records as complete, unimpaired, and undivided as possible. The ability to consult the evidence and sources used by researchers and authors will be lost if these digital records are not available. The ability to investigate the history and current state of the world across all disciplines will be compromised if born digital materials are gone or changed. And the ability to access and use the sources of record will be difficult if they are deposited and dispersed in multiple and disparate sites. Let me share some, some scenarios with you. Let's consider a scholar who prepares a major research paper and it is published in a prestigious journal. The paper includes in its reference several born digital items which are critical to the arguments of the author. Another researcher reads the paper in that journal and disagrees with the conclusions and wants to consult the evidence. However, the sources are no longer retrievable and cannot be reviewed. The links are broken on the sites, they have been taken down, or they have been significantly changed. Is this an issue of scholarly integrity? Or this second scenario, a researcher on the debate over climate change wants to locate and review the websites and other reports of organizations, government agencies, and individuals that have presented data, arguments, and recommendations over the past decade. The researcher finds that many of these sources are no longer available and thus cannot be consulted, thus making it difficult, if not impossible, for the research project to proceed. Is this an issue of scholarly integrity? Or this third scenario, a researcher completes an important research study and it is accepted by a leading journal in the field. The paper and the research data supporting the project will be available through the publisher repository. Because of the agreement that the author negotiated with the publisher, the researcher is allowed to make the work available in various other open access sites. So the work also appears in a disciplinary repository, in an institutional repository at the researcher's institution, in a special academic department repository, in a research data repository, in a government repository because of the grant that funded the project, on his personal website, on the teaching course website of the researcher, in a national repository, and so on. Which version of this work will be discovered, used, cited, preserved without changes? 
Is this condition of repository chaos an issue of scholarly integrity? The collection, curation, and preservation of born digital content cut across the full range of core responsibilities of libraries. But our procedures, our workflows, our policies, and our technologies are insufficient to the tasks of born digital selection, acquisition, synthesis, navigation, discovery, dissemination, interpretation, understanding, use, application, and preservation. We failed. How do we confront the conditions of constant mutation, of waves of new applications, of unfriendly public policy, of self-imposed pressures to create the collective collection, of unrealistic and unclear user and researcher expectations and requirements. At the core of born digital content preservation, I believe, are four principles. We must hold the content, the repository as archive, because we cannot preserve what we have not collected. We must enable access, the repository as persistence. We must secure the content, the archive as curation. And we must take care of the content, the repository as steward. New technologies are feeding the explosion in born digital content. Each year, Educause and the New Media Consortium publish the Horizon Report, which documents and describes important developments. Some examples from the past few years, I think, will illustrate the symbiosis and demonstrate this explosion in born digital material. Just consider mobile devices and tablets cloud computing with distributed processing and applications, geo-everything, geolocation, geotagging, the personal web, and customized management of online content, linked data, connecting and relating structured information, semantic aware applications that link, link meaning to answers, smart objects and smart spaces that connect information and the physical world, open content with wide distribution and wide use, massive open online learning experiences, electronic books in the array of platforms and applications, big data and big science driving new forms of research information management, games as learning tools with participation and interaction, visualizations that bring meaning and understanding to data. The challenge of born digital content comes at the point when libraries are really confronting some critical trends. We are experiencing rapidly shifting user behaviors and expectations. We are trying to figure out how to move away from redundant, inefficient, re, re, shared library operations and aging service paradigms. We recognize the need to achieve scale and network effects through aggregation in an environment of advanced open architecture and the acceleration of collective innovation. We are facing metadata, metadata chaos in terms of its quality, its currency, and its accuracy. We face a new economic context and a mandate for systemic change. We are not sure how to deal with conditions of massive surveillance, security meltdowns, threats to network neutrality, and corporate control of the infrastructures of information discovery and content. How does, how does Born Digital fit into what libraries do? We support teaching and learning, research and scholarship, and community health and development. We respond to a societal and global mandate. We respond in how, we will, how our roles and processes will be extended to embrace born digital content, or will be massive challenges spawn a new vision, a new purpose, new methods, and new systems 
I believe that's what we're talking about here over the next two days. Quality equals content plus functionality. How do we make sure that the born digital content is preserved but also remains usable long term? That means that we understand and accommodate the important characteristics of digital information. Accessibility and availability with no constraints on time and geography. The searchability and researchability being able to ask new questions. The currency and real-time nature of this information. Its dynamism and fluidity and linkability. The collaborative and interactive nature of that information. And its encyclopedic potential, but also its modularity, its volatility, and its fragility. Born digital resources also force us to consider the relationship among form, text, and function, where content is no longer tied to format. We are encouraged to be more sensitive to context, renderability, and versioning over time. We see the inevitability of physical and format obsolescence, the importance of authenticity and provenance, and the role of standards such as globally unique identifiers. The scope, depth, and the cost of the threat means that individual libraries cannot advance born digital content preservation on their own. We need to radicalize cooperation, promoting new combinations and new public-private partnerships through national and global systemic strategies. There is an adage that says, every snowflake and an avalanche pleads not guilty. Whether it is the creation of centers of excellence or new thinking about mass production or new infrastructures or new initiatives and programs, we must start from a position of collaboration so as to maximize quality, productivity, and innovation. We must pull together the polycentric nature, the distributed nature of the way born digital materials are being captured, organized, and preserved, and build new collaborative approaches. We will not have the technologies, the tools, the workflows, and standards unless we work together in new ways. It will be challenging, I also think, to create a robust and successful born digital content preservation capacity without new thinking about copyright. Libraries are capturing and preserving digital materials as fair use. Efforts to produce new exceptions or limitations in Section 108 of the Copyright Act, something I worked on for three years, for purposes of digital preservation have not been successful. Our law is out of sync with technology and user needs. Where does the preservation of born digital content intersect with orphan works, with transformative use, with the public interest? What should be the relationship between licensing and copyright limitations? What about the issue of open content and proprietary rights? How do we manage national copyright provisions in a global networked environment? I attended a few weeks ago a meeting convened by the IMLS to look at the questions around the national digital platform. I raised at that meeting some key questions that we have formulated over time, which really are challenging us to sort of refresh our approach, our national approach to this set of issues. And here are the questions that I put on the table. How do we move from scattered institutional investments and siloed projects to national and global programs? How do we expand our understanding of digital content creation at large scale to create curation, discovery, use, and preservation of digital content? How do we build tools that are ubiquitous, iterative, transparent, and integrated? How do we build infrastructure at global scale and create public-private partnerships with publishers, media companies, search engines, social media, and importantly, with our faculty, with our teachers, our researchers, and users and creators of information. 
really to advance our digital platform objectives. And our libraries recruiting, developing, and retaining the professional staff who can lead us in practice and performance. I, remi I reminded that audience of several contexts that I think we need to always consider. The global context. How does our work integrate into an international venue? The policy context, where licensing so often displaces the public law of copyright. How do we build user-supportive policy? The, the diversity context. How do we make sure that what we're preserving is not just the winners and the information that traditionally has survived, but how do we use this as a new model for participation, wide participation in the discussion, but also affirmative inclusion of diverse perspectives and diverse content in what is preserved? How do we understand users, particularly the teaching learning context, as more and more of this content is integrated into the classrooms, both virtual and physical? Where does scholarly communication fit? What's the context of the integration of this stuff into the way scholars gather, present their ideas, and archive that information? How do we move from kumbaya to a period of more polygamy to a period of more radical collaboration? And where is the national leadership? What is the role of the Library of Congress? What is the role of the National Archives? What is the role of OCLC? What is the role of ALA? I think these national professional organizations need to step up, step up in far more rigorous ways to build the type of national and global conversation and capability to get the job done. How many libraries have well-developed plans for born digital content capture, description, and preservation? How many institutions have put in place the funding to enable and sustain these plans? How are those agencies and foundations that fund libraries and support learning and scholarship re responding to this challenge? Do we truly understand user expectations for digital content and how it will be used? What digital content has persistent value and how will we make sound conditions on what to collect and to preserve? How will persistence and quality be ensured? How will collaborative efforts be structured and good governance and sustainability, um, sustainability be preserved and ensured? What is needed for operational, organizational, and architectural scalability? It is, I will argue, our predetermined role in the academy, in the library community. It is our role, our fate, and I would argue our destiny to serve society's interest and to take on the full responsibility through the collective library and the collective university for the preservation of born digital content. I hope these remarks were interesting and provocative and give you a context to talk about these issues over the course of the next two days. Thank you for this opportunity. Bob says I should take questions. Um, Jim, so at the IMLS meeting around the ideas around digital platform, did this I, did did this sort of sense more come up around the in collaborating in doing something like web archiving to address these ideas of, you know, we're in different sectors. A lot of us are in universities, but just that idea of how will, how can we and is is the government is IMLS putting funding, thinking about this sort of putting this stuff forward for us to be able to have something on which we can build and do our programmatic yeah. web archiving? I, I think it was recognized and embraced as a key issue. 
a key national priority. Uh, Brewster Kale was there, and so we had an opportunity to talk about where Internet Archive fits into this conversation and this solution. Um, I think there was an effort to, to talk, as I have tried to do today, at a, a, a sort of the born digital level as opposed to just uh, web archiving, although it was recognized. Um, the IMLS, uh, about a year ago, and it was a meeting I participated in, raised the question of whether they should be uh, funding a lot of interesting projects and experiments or whether they should concentrate the resources the limited resources into major grants for major uh, infrastructure um, development. And that's why I think we've seen the grants in the last round of IMLS, they're larger and they're more directed. And they're looking more at what they're calling the national digital platform as what they're choosing to invest in now. Um, DPLA was also there and we raised the issue of, of when and how we move in DPLA beyond the important things that are being done today in terms of the digitization of historical content uh, to capturing more of the born digital materials. It was recognized that the two key points that I made today, public policy, particularly copyright, and collaboration, were going to be critical in order to make those advances. Uh, but we also recognize that with each second of each day, uh, the problem gets worse and worse, and the scenarios that I outlined become more common. Hi, Jim. Um, where else have you been giving this talk? Um, you need to reach out, you know, obviously beyond the choir. Um, have you talked to John Paulson? He gave yeah. Harvard 400 million, but he yeah. still has a lot of money. Well, he's left. a graduate and he gave it to the School of Engineering. So. <laughs> yeah. But really, I mean, it, it's so important. Yeah. No, I agree. I, I, I've just been asked, uh, I've been participating in a series of meetings with the Social Science Research Council. Um, and one of the issues I've raised in that context is this suite of concerns. And they've just asked me this week to join a group that will focus on this issue within the context of the social sciences. They're sort of really worried about the um, incident in issue of integrity that was raised by that graduate student in his PhD dissertation out in California. Um, and so they, they're starting to connect the dots um, of, of how integrity needs to be more widely defined and social sciences could be at risk, uh, research in the social sciences could be at risk if we don't collectively begin to deal with these things. They, they recognize the role of the library and I've been trying to say to them, as I tried to also suggest here, is that we are part of the solution but we are not the solution libraries. Uh, this has got to be a larger, um, a larger public and scholarly investment that's made to make this, to solve and advance some of these issues. To agree with everything I said, right? <laughs> All right, this was the choir. Thank you, Stephen. <laughs> we do agree with everything you said. Okay, um, thank you, Stephen. Uh, but the copyright issue. Ah. I mean, that you spent three years on and, and didn't really succeed. That, that's such a blocker for so many of the things that you just mentioned. And, and I'm and just wondering, what's the prospect? What it's, it's, I think we're at risk more than ever. Um, if anyone read the GAO report on the status of the Copyright Office in LC, one recognizes some of the uh, issues that we're going to be dealing with over the next several years. Uh, copyright reform is in the wind but it's not the type of copyright reform that we probably would put ourselves behind. Um, I think there is concern that um, the Copyright Office is looking to move out of the Library of Congress and to find a home elsewhere in the federal infrastructure, probably more aligned with the economic side of the house, commerce side of the house, which to me is a major problem. Um, and I think the types of issues that we raised in the one, the 108 study group document and report is quite, I think, um, uh, innovative and forward looking. Uh, but there was not agreement among the parties at the table, which included lots of representatives from the content community around these types of issues of long term preservation. Um, I don't accept the position taken by the content community that don't worry, libraries, we're, we'll take care of this stuff. Uh, we know what that means, and uh, we've seen it in terms of our um, modest ability 
uh, through things like Portico and the continuing centrality importance of LOX clocks in order to capture um, material, published material. Um, but we know it's, it falls far short. So if we can't take care of the, of the routine stuff, if I could use that word, how are we going to take care of all this other stuff, uh, which is going to be increasingly important? But I think this, we're seeing in developments at WIPO where library exceptions and, and, and limitations are on the table, and we're seeing in innovations in national copyright laws in some of the uh, countries around the world. Uh, but the fact remains that uh, nearly, I think by Kenny's, Kenny Cruz's estimation, um, over 80% of the world's um, uh, nations do not have exceptions or limitations in their law, copyright law for libraries, archives, and museums. I knew mentioning locks clocks would provoke a question. No, actually, I've been thinking about saying this. I'm reminded of the Pogo quote, <laughs> we have met the enemy and he is us, is that? Is that or she. Right? Or she. And Jim, I remember sitting in your office at Columbia 10 years ago and having a conversation very much like this. And... Um, Who were you meeting with? You. Oh, me. <laughs> you. I was meeting with you. Okay. And we were talking about... So I was right then, wasn't you I? Were, you were right then, and we were talking about um, um, ARL and leadership yes. and born digital and preservation and the need for the libraries to continue to build collections and take responsibility. And I wonder if you've seen a shift, a positive shift over the last decade to finally have, that finally sh shows us that more people are willing to step up. I think I have seen more of a recognition of the challenge and why it's important and the complexity of it. And I think when people look at that scale and, and complexity, they sort of back up and say, oh my goodness, uh, this is more than I can deal with. Um, and therefore, the collaborative national systemic, if not global systemic approach is going to be important. National libraries around the world are taking some responsibility for domain content preservation. Uh, I think it varies in terms of the rigor and managing for the mutability of that information, uh, but at least there's some recognition in some of the countries in the world that an agency needs to step up and do this on behalf of a country. We don't have that here. Um, uh, Brewster's done a great job in helping us uh, capture long-term web, some web content, but he acknowledges in, in terms of how he does it and what he picks up and what he doesn't pick up in that effort. Um, and it just doesn't get into the communities, the universities, the cities, the governments, and so forth, um, in ways that I think are going to be essential going forward. So yes, I think it's being embraced and recognized, but I think we're far, far short of the solutions that we need. That's why this meeting is so important. Um, so Jim, one more thing, and, it, and it's, it, I guess it is pushing back a little bit maybe on a couple yeah. of things that you said, and it's that um, I think for, for good reasons, um, we keep talking about libraries. I agree. And, yeah. and, uh, and in fact, there's you know, the archives that are not in libraries, there's all the archives that are doing um, born digital, you know, archiving, collecting of material that may also happen to be web only kinds of information. And so I think that that idea of the who are we talking about, what is this, what is the community, what is the, the, the collaborations and, the, and therefore the platforms of also all the archival communities and, and you know, whether that's in private companies and in institutions and in, in public sector and private sector, non-government, that there's a, there's, we, we also need to be brought into the table, not just to the exclusion of if we're not in a library, then we're not a part of this. Yeah. And I think I, that that's an important I part to bring I agree 150% with your observation. Um, I said at the beginning I was going to use a library lens, but for me, um, library equals LAM. Um, libraries, archives, and museums, uh, cultural organizations. I got beat up on this issue at the IMLS meeting as well, and I sort of hugged the person virtually and said, I 100% agree with you as well. So my vocabulary needs to change, but I totally embrace 
the role of the, li of the larger archival community uh, in this effort. But I also recognize the importance of the scholars, the teachers, the faculty, um, the, the authors who produce this stuff, whatever it might be. Uh, but individual authors, individual institutions, individual uh, libraries are not going to be able to solve this problem. So, absolutely. And that's now on the record again. So, okay. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jim. I think that, that context and that broader uh, perspective on things is really going to be helpful as we go through the day and uh, think about these things just in more detail. I will say, you know, these days when Jim talks about physical and format obsolescence, I'm afraid he's talking about me, but, but I'll let that go. Uh, so as we prepare to, to move into the, uh, the panel sessions, I just want to say a couple of words about the two themes that, that we're talking about and how we, why we came up with those themes. And it dates back again to that conference in 2012, where uh, two of the findings, conclusions, um, ideas that emerged from that. One was that there's a lot of things that, that a host of things that need to happen technically uh, to, to make web archiving work better, to make it easier, to make the results uh, and, and the use of the, the content uh, improve. And uh, part of the uh, grant that we have received from the, the Mellon Foundation included seed funding for what has turned out to be six uh, technology development, tool development projects and so one of the main objectives of the meeting today is to provide an opportunity for the lead researchers on those projects to present their work to an audience like this and discuss its, uh, its significance and what they've done. Uh, the other big idea that came out of that was a recognition that it, libraries, and this, this gets back to some of the themes that Jim was talking about, libraries acting on their own individually are only going to be able to take the, this kind of initiative so far and that we're going to need to collaborate and build both connections and structures probably in a variety of different ways. And so the next second theme and the second present set of presentations interspersed today are uh, discussions and, and presentations on activities that are already taking place to try to build these collaborations and on, towards the end of the day, on uh, some reflections on what we may need to do that goes much further and, and works on a larger and broader scale for these things. <clears throat> 